Yo, what up guys? How you doing today? This is episode 15 of BTD5 Science, and we're going to talk about viruses. So viruses are actually a really interesting topic, and I think we're going to go into a lot of the basics today. Nothing too crazy and specific. Uh, I'll try and stay away from specifics as much as possible. I'm trying to keep this for high school students, maybe a little bit lower than that. Maybe a little bit higher, you guys can learn some stuff as well. But if you don't know anything about viruses, this is more for you. If you know a lot about viruses, probably not so much. So what is a virus? A virus is basically just some genetic material inside a protein coat, and what it does is it infects other cells so it can replicate. And we're going to talk about a lot more of what it's made up of and how if it's a living thing or not um, a little bit later. But for right now, we have to talk about a couple other things really quick. So viruses, they can basically infect all types of organisms, plants, animals, bacteria, archaea, they can infect them all. And that's an interesting aspect to viruses is that they pretty much infect everything. And by the way, we're talking about viruses and we think about viruses as a uh, bad thing. You know, they're all totally bad because all they do is infect things. While on the other hand, bacteria can actually be good things. For example, bacteria in our guts, they're good things. Bacteria can also be bad as well, but most viruses are basically all bad, or are they? Well, as far as living things go, yeah, they're pretty bad. You know, they're not going to help you at all. But as far as species goes, as far as populations go, viruses can actually not be that bad. Uh, they're actually super important for how we know life today, specifically having to do with evolution. Because what happens is they increase horizontal gene, gene transfer, which increases diversity over time. So, you probably don't realize it, but what viruses do is oftentimes they actually put genetic material inside of your cells, sometimes on accident, sometimes on purpose, but this genetic material can of course affect the organism, and over time it just leads to a little bit of evolution basically because that little bit of genetic material doesn't do anything and it can evolve to maybe do something over time. So how did, how did viruses actually come to exist? We don't really know. We don't know exactly. Uh, we probably know this even less than we know about bacteria, but what we think happened is they probably evolved from some sort of plasmids. So bacteria normally have a really big circular chromosome that has pretty much all of the genetic material but also they have things things called plasmids which they help with they which which they share between bacteria and things like that and what happened is these plasmids could have maybe maybe had quite a few genes that maybe made some sort of virus type of thing it was probably a protovirus something we don't really completely understand how it happened or anything but that's the basic understanding of how it happened also we think maybe a bacteria just evolved into a virus so it's uh, kind of confusing on how that could have happened, and just kind of weird thinking about those types of things, but it is possible. So how are viruses spread? Well, viruses can be spread in a bunch of different ways. They can be spread through pretty much any sort of bodily fluid. Of course, most viruses aren't spread through all bodily fluids. They're more along the line of certain types of bodily fluids, especially, especially blood, guys. Blood is the main carrier of viruses. And also they can be spread through a bunch of other things, such as insects, uh, specific, more specifically, most of the time, mosquitoes for humans, aphids for plants, aphids are a huge problem for plants, and um, a lot of other things. A lot of other things can spread it as well, but we're not going to go into too much detail. I think insects are probably the main thing. Also, this is just a really nice word that you guys should probably know, vector. Vector means that some sort of pathogen is being transferred by this organism. So a uh, mosquito is a vector for uh, different types of viruses. And we're going to talk more specifically about, uh, of course, viruses and insects being a vector for viruses. Uh, and normally what's going to happen is you're going to have some sort of like human they will get bit by a mosquito and they'll suck out some of the blood and the human will be infected by this virus and the mosquito will absorb these viruses into its stomach and then what happens is is the virus will actually move from the mosquito's stomach up to its salivary gland and then you know what happens when a mosquito bites another person guys? Uh oh, spaghettios. What happens is, is the mosquito sticks its little proboscis, little no, little mouth thingamabob into your skin, and it puts a little bit of saliva in there, and that transfers a little bit of viruses into your body. So that's how a vector occurs, more specifically with having to do with mosquitoes. And I actually took an entomology course, and that's how I know a lot about those mosquito things.
And I thought that was actually probably one of the most interesting classes I've ever taken. The next thing is, is probably the biggest question about this entire video. Probably the quadrillion dollar question. Not really, not really, because you're not going to get any money if you answer this question, because it's completely debated and you can't actually have a finite answer. But are viruses living? This is an interesting question. I think most people, if they're watching this video, they're probably going to say, no, viruses are not living. But this is a really, really hard question to answer. Basically, why are viruses considered non-living? They're, they're considered non-living probably by most scientists, but I honestly have no problem saying they are living. The two main reasons why people say they are not living usually is that, first of all, they need some sort of host to replicate, which I think is kind of mumbo-jumbo sometimes because think of a lot of parasites or a lot of things that need a host to replicate as well. So that, I just kind of throw it out the window because even though you need that cell to replicate, so do a lot of other parasites and stuff. So I don't, I don't care about that thing. Also, the main one, I think this is the main reason why people say, oh, Viruses, they can't be life, because they don't really have a metabolism. Yeah. Everything, they use energy to create to create the proteins and create the stuff and move around and do all that stuff. Viruses don't do that. They're just kind of there, and they float around, and, you know, they don't really move or try and do anything on purpose. It just kind of happens. That's about how a virus works. It's kind of weird how you think that it just happens, but it does. But, um... If this is kind of the only reason that we're calling something non-life compared to life, I think it's kind of a bad reason. So overall, viruses are kind of tinkering on the edge between life and non-life. And I personally would consider them more towards the edge of considering them life compared to non-life. Just think about it like this. They evolve over time. They change through natural selection. They're made up of the exact same stuff we are. DNA, RNA, all that stuff. That's what viruses are made up. Va viruses can die. Their genetic material becomes worthless over time. So that's why I think they are life. If things can die, they have uh same stuff we're made up of. They evolve. I don't know. I just consider that life. So now I told you guys we're going to get in more details about what they're made up of just a little bit later, and it's about time now. Viruses are super ridiculously simple. What are they made up of? Well, they can be made up of quite a few different things, actually. First off, you have the genetic material, the stuff that's inside, the stuff that actually makes up the virus, which viruses are not very big, by the way. Viruses can be as small as like 8 to 10 genes. Not much at all. 5,000 base pairs, 6,000, 10,000 base pairs. That's not a lot of genetic material at all, considering that we have like a gene, one gene that's made up of that much stuff inside of us. When you have one gene that makes up an entire virus, holy crap, all uh, gets kind of crazy. That how small these things actually are, how much, how little amount of genetic material you need to make one of these guys. So they can be made up of quite a few different types of genetic material. Uh, you guys probably heard of DNA. They can be made of a double-stranded DNA, but that's not even very common. Normally, they're made up of plus-strand RNA, negative-strand RNA. Those are probably the two most common. They can also be made up of just one strand of DNA, so they can be made up of plus-strand DNA or negative-strand DNA um, or double-stranded RNA. So we don't really think about double-stranded RNA ever even existing, but it does exist inside of viruses. Now, these things are not that common. Sometimes they're only in one or two couple families of viruses or classes of viruses or even species, I guess. You can consider species of viruses. But overall, the genetic material is actually very different compared to what we're used to as life as well. And then you also have the protein coat. So this is the protein coat. Uh, protein coat basically covers up all that little genetic material and kind of protects it. That's all it does. We also call this a capsid. So that's the capsid is just the protector of the genetic material. And what happens is, is you have, like I said, like 8 to 10 genes. Uh, and oftentimes you have like one or two of those genes actually just make up the capsid. So uh, you'll have one of those, one or two of those genes make a protein that the protein connects together and you eventually get the genetic material inside of these proteins that should connect together into the fully formed virus. Also, there's a third part to some viruses. There's this thing called the envelope. So the envelope also helps protect it beyond the protein coat. And how they get the envelope is that some of them, when they're leaving the cell, they basically just bubble off of the cell and they'll... Uh, uh, just steal some of the envelope, some of the little fluid layer at the end of a cell. 
and they'll steal that, and that's what helps protect the virus a little bit more. Not all of them do this. Uh, I'd, I'd say, I don't know. I don't know exactly how many exactly. I'd say probably 60-70% probably do have an envelope, but that's more of a guess than anything, so uh, don't quote me on that. So anyways, if you guys found this at all interesting, if you find viruses interesting, uh, please subscribe to my new science channel because I'm not going to talk very much more about viruses on this channel, but when I get my new science channel, I think viruses are a very interesting topic, and I would definitely like to hear some uh, uh, suggestions on what types of viruses you'd like me to talk about, or any more, anything more specific you'd like me to talk about. Always suggestions, comments, all that stuff, appreciate it a bunch. Please put some stuff down there, it really helps me out. Thanks for watching, and have a great day.